The following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. We are back. Giant space ball, past, present, and future. And it is kind of a somber day in Giantville. Um, uh, yesterday we lost uh, who is arguably the most uh, popular giant, the San Francisco giant of all time. And I'm including Willie Mays in that. Um, we lost Willie McCovey. And um, uh, we have, we're awaiting Michael Duca, who is the co-host of, of this show. He's tardy today, but uh, have a panel of folks that can talk about Willie a little bit. Um, a fellow podcaster and an author in his own right, um, Skip Lockwood, former closer of the New York Mets, is here. Um, how are you, Skip? I'm doing great. I'm doing the cloudy old wee day after the Red Sox parade yesterday through the center of town. Did so, you attend uh, that? I did. I went down to it. Oh, wow. It's, uh, it's very meaningful to, to see a whole town uh, so excited and enthusiastic. About did you bring your grandson and, with you? No, it was too much. There was, you know, many millions of people around the route, and uh, it was just too much, too much going on. Maybe, okay. Maybe next uh, year if they win or they win after year after. Well, uh, there's n- no better timing. Um, Jerry Feidelberg, fellow podcaster yes, sir. on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, is here. He, he uh, before we get into Willie McCovey. Um, let's talk to Jerry, and, and both you and Skip are uh, lifelong Boston Red Sox fans, and um, you can talk about how um, – I want to ask you, ask you guys a question. The Red Sox of 2018 have been compared to some of the teams that they mentioned, the 27 Yankees, the 61 Yankees, uh, some of the great teams of all, all time. Uh, do you you guys think that this version of the Red Sox is right up up there with those teams? And I'll start with you, Jerry. Well, I, I certainly think that they're one of the best teams of all time. They won 108 games during the regular season, and they won 11 games in the playoffs for a total of 119. And the, I think the team that you could compare them to is the 1998 Yankees that won 114 and then 11 games. Uh, so they won 125. That would, that would probably be a, a more valid uh, comparison than with the 27 Yankees. Because who knows? Who knows how they shape up? The two different eras, we, you, you just know it's hard to compare them. But they, without question, are one of the best teams of all time. Uh, um, was it your favorite Red Sox team of all time, Jerry? Uh, not of all time. The, my my favorite team was the 2004 team because they won it for the first time in 86 years, right. and they broke the curse. And it was, you know, I had I had been following the Red Sox since 1946, and that's oh, that's what 71, 72 years. And I, I know that year and, well. Yes, indeed. And, <laughs> Sadly. And it, was, <laughs> and it was years of frustrations with the Red Sox. And my, my late brother used to always ask me, why do you love the Red Sox? They always break your heart. And they did for years and years and years. And then redemption came in 2004 when they won the World Series. It was a feeling like no other. It was so special. It was unbelievable. Okay, may I ask you, um, Skip, what was your favorite Red Sox team growing up as a kid? Well, uh, you and I have talked about this before. Um, I didn't follow the Red Sox that much. Um, I played, you know, Little League and and baseball and everything. I didn't follow the A's, the the Red Sox, very much. Um, You know, Williams was always a, a guy that, 
came to mind when the, when the Sox played uh, uh, Malzone, who he became a friend of mine. Uh, oh uh, wow! Yeah, but teams, teams Ron never Spoy. Really saw, uh, uh, follow the teams. My opinion about this team here is that they came together late. Uh, it looked like they were they were winning a lot of games through the season, and then they got they plateaued around a, a hundred games, and then they they didn't win at the end of the season. Didn't play well. There was some bickering going on. Hanley Ramirez was on the team, and um, and they they had to make some changes. I think defensively. It's one of the all-time teams ever. I can't imagine a better outfield uh, than Ben Attendee and, and JBJ and Betts uh, in the outfield. I think defensively, at least in the outfield, it was it was unbelievable. Um, uh, Betts um, especially, um, terrific. A terrific right fielder with a great arm. And he was versatile. I think he came up, if I'm not mistaken, as a second baseman. Yeah. And he, he was more than adequate. And there was some talk of playing him at second in in the World Series. I don't think it, it came to be. Um, but having his versatility certainly um, doesn't hurt. I want to ask you guys about Alex Cora. This is uh, – he's one of the – few first-year managers to have won it all. Um, is he as good as um, as advertised, or is it, and this is very subjective, is, is it the talent on the team, or is it the manager? Um, what did you guys think of Cora, Jerry, first? Well, I think you know, Alex was the bench coach with the Houston Astros last year. And he got a taste of winning. But I think what everyone is saying about Alex is that he has been able to communicate with the team a lot better than uh, the former manager, John Farrell. You know, Farrell didn't do all that bad a job. He won a championship with them in 2013, and then he took them to the division title the last couple of years. But uh, apparently Farrell, the players turned off Farrell. They weren't listening to him. And uh, Alex, like uh, a lot of good managers, one of the things that they say that a good manager has to be able to do is to explain the role of the player so that they know what their situation is on the team and they're not left guessing as to whether they're going to play or when they're going to play, that type of thing. So I think that uh, that's where he earned his money this year in being able to explain to the players what he wanted to do and how they were going to execute, and they, they came through for him. Okay. Um you want to elaborate on that, Skip? Yes, uh, I do. Um, I know Alex Cora a little bit. Um, a- a- AC is an unusual guy. Uh, Puerto Rican guy. He comes from Caguas, uh, Puerto Rico. Um, in fact, I think they're bringing the trophy down to Puerto Rico this weekend uh, to his hometown, to his mother, and they're going to take it around the town uh, down in Caguas, Puerto Rico. Uh, AC nice. is a guy, <clears throat> as, as Jerry just said, is communicates very well. I, I thought Farrell communicated pretty well with the players also, but there's, there's a, a group of players in a team, no matter what team you have, that have to be on board uh, <coughs> with the division, with the, with the, uh, the way in which the team looks and, and the way in which it goes on the field every day. Um, Pedroia is one of the players that has to be on side, and there's some other guys. Veritek is on the bench. These are two older players. Uh, Veritek's coaching now. I don't know whether Pedroia is going to come back or not, but those are two players that have to be on board the division uh, for the team um, on a daily basis. Uh, Fellow, I mean, um, AC in spring training, Went around and had dinner. Bought a bought a dinner for each one of the guys uh, that was going to be on the 25. More than just 25, but he went out individually with these guys and talked about them and talked about what they see and what what was important for them for the season and how they most likely were going to be used. 
uh, uh, as, as Jerry just said, it's very important for players to have an expectation about what's going to happen. How, you know, am I going to get a chance to pinch hit? Am I starting? Um, getting ready for the, especially uh, World Series games, um, everybody's on board. So you don't have to worry about those games. But, boy, leading up to the World Series and you've got an expanded 40-man roster, you're trying to get pitchers to get their, their innings in, you're trying to look at some new guys. And that's a very tenuous position the last month of the season trying to get everybody squared away and, and ready to play. You don't even know what the roster is going to be a lot of times until the last week or so. I think I think Cora did an extraordinary job. He's got coaches with him and everything, but he's taken the front, and, and this is a young ball club that came together with a, an image and a vision of what winning looks like. <clears throat> I, there's a commercial on TV for – I don't know whether you've seen it, <laughs> Aflac. And there's three dogs sitting in the back of a car, and they're, they're white labs. And something goes by, and all three dogs look at the same direction at the same time. It's very cute. It's laughable to watch that happen. Um, you've got to get 25 players on the team all watching the same thing at the same time. And, and that's very difficult to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I think Cora is one of those guys that was able to reach them, reach inside of them, and, and, and bring them to a place where they all play very, very well when they, when they needed to. Um, very, very well said, as a matter of fact. Um, let's get to Willie Mack. I just got a note from Michael Duca that he um, got some – has some technical problems and won't be joining us. I invited the former bat boy of the Giants in Willie McCovey's day and a regular contributor to this uh, network, Patrick Quinlan, to join us. He hasn't yet. And um, so let me ask you, um, Skip, what was pitching to Willie McCovey like well uh, I think it said of, of Hank Aaron uh, trying to sneak a fastball by Hank Aaron was like trying to sneak Don past a rooster uh, <laughs> Willie McCuffey was the same uh, he was a big swinger a big guy I mean he was long and lanky and um uh, I never really picked up his bat, but I'm told that he was he swung a, a 40 ounce bat. Um, Dick Allen, Dick Allen swung a 40 ounce bat, and that was very scary. Um, the, uh, the they they didn't have exit just, times, exit speeds in those days, or they may have had them, but um, they weren't recording them. Uh, imagine what Dick Allen's and Willie McCovey's exit speed would be? Well, the, the exit speed would be the speed at which the relief pitchers leave the ballpark. So <laughs> because of the game. Um, I, Ralph and Jerry knows also. I had one pitch when I was pitching in, in the National League, and it was a fastball. I used to love this face, McCovey, because he was an uppercutter. And, and I could chase that fastball up under his hands and, and get it by him. And he'd try to hit home runs. And, and I, I was able to, to force the issue a little bit with a four seam fastball that was riding up and, and into him. Uh, I did try to throw him a curveball one day that, that lost the game for us. So, uh, I, I, I had to go back to my original strategy, but. He was a big swinger, uppercutter, hit the ball a mile. Well, and um, would you compare facing him and facing Cepeda in the same lineup? Or maybe you weren't, maybe you didn't face them in the same lineup. But I yeah. know you faced, um, you, you faced Orlando. Yeah, I faced Orlando and I faced Aaron 
uh, Hank Aaron uh, in a game that I pitched in Milwaukee against the Braves. Uh, I didn't play against them when I pitched with the Mets. Uh, I was I was too late to play against mm-hmm. them. So I only saw them for, for one game. Hank Aaron was a cameo in Milwaukee. He was coming in. They played an exhibition game. They were trying to put some more people in the, in the stadium. Um, it was Bud Selig's idea to, to have a day. Um, I never got the face of Peter, so I can't really make a comment about that. I, this is off the subject a little bit, but I'm just curious. Did the Milwaukee fans take to the Brewers? Did the former Milwaukee Braves fans take to the Brewers? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, it, it was a National League ballpark. And, and here's an American League team with with a no name offense and pitching was was you know guys in their twenties. Uh, the Milwaukee Sentinel uh, was the paper that really covered the the Brewers, and you'd have to go three pages deep every day to find anything about baseball in there. You know, it was it was uh, it was. Uh, Everything bowling, there was fishing, there was hunting. That if you got deep enough in there, you'd find something about baseball. But uh, there, it wasn't a baseball town. I think it's changed now. I think they've really embraced the Brewers now. Big, big field and, and huge ballpark and everything. But when yeah, I played, and they were Sealy uh, uh, deemed them a National League team um, after a while too. I think that really helped. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, Bud Bud brought him back into the National League. He was he was a Braves fan, but uh, when he was young, when the Braves went to Milwaukee, and uh, he thought that the Brewers belonged in the National League. Although when the uh, Brewers were in the American League, they used to give the A's fits. Uh, Phil Garner was the manager; he used to outmanage the A's all the time. Yeah, um, you weren't a part of. Um, Skip, you weren't a part of Harvey Keene's wall bangers, were you? Well, Harvey was the, uh, the bench coach uh, when I was there. Um, he, what, a, what a sweet man. He, he had a bar down in the, in the south of Milwaukee, and uh, he was a fixture at the bar. So if you want to talk to baseball, just drive down the south side of Milwaukee and, and go to, to Harvey's. And uh, Harvey would probably be sitting there. Uh, Harvey would talk baseball to anybody, to everybody. Uh, if you go through the airport, he'd strike up a conversation with people walking by. Um, Harvey was was a guy that um, I just think was a, uh, an inspirational leader in, in a way for, for a town like Milwaukee. It's a blue collar town, and uh, he just came from this came from the the town and knew everybody and he was uh he was just amazing i didn't play you know for him as a manager uh but i can't imagine uh that that he was he was just awesome because yeah, he was a people person and um are we losing that with this analytical um uh, stuff going on which is certainly legitimate but are we losing managers that uh, just stay in touch with their hunches and with their uh, feelings and they're looking at the player in the eye and seeing um, and asking the player how he feels as opposed to, uh, you know, just looking at numbers? Are we losing that? Uh, I'm sure Jerry could comment also, but I don't think so. I think having more data and more analytics in baseball than ever before it was very evident, I think, <clears throat> in the World Series that just played out uh, with the, the pitchers and the way that the, 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 uh, the, pitching, the, the pitchers were lined up and the way they defended um, the different players. Um, I don't think so. I think you still got an awful lot of baseball that's played with the soul and with the heart and face-to-face, man-to-man. 
I, I, I do, do think there's an element that, that has improved the game a little bit with, with the sabermetrics they use. <clears throat> My problem is with the shift. I really don't like that shift. And Neither do I. I think, Neither do I. I think it's like zone defense in basketball. You know, the, the shift just seems to me like we never had it. You know, you got guys, Ted Williams, and trying to hit 400. He didn't hit against the shift. <clears throat> he couldn't hit the left field. You know, it, it was, I think it's jeopardizing a lot of the records in baseball. Yeah, and it also takes away, it also takes away from the game. You, you, you can't have a hit and run. Uh, it's really hard to execute it. Uh, a lot of the things that they do today, they don't bunt as much as they used to. Uh, and so the running game is down. The whole thing has totally changed, but we're getting off track a, a bit. I, I, I think you're talking about the Brewers and, and the Dodgers and the, and the managers using his gut. Uh, I think that a lot of guys, a lot of managers go with pitch count. Uh, particularly, uh, I think it was, which game was Rich Hill Pitt playing? Uh, game four, was it? He was in the, uh, he went six and a third innings. He, in the, he was in the seventh inning, he had only given up one hit. and was pitching really well and was baffling the Red Sox. And uh, Dave Roberts decided to take him out. And uh, the, the Red Sox were trailing four nothing and they won the game nine six. And, uh, he, Roberts came under a lot of criticism for taking him out. And you have a guy that's going well, and then he said that uh, Hill told him he was getting tired. But who knows? Uh, you know, we're trying to second-guess the manager at the time. But back in the old days, they probably would let the guy, uh, if that were Warren Spahn or Juan, Juan Marichal, they would say, you can't take me out. I, I remember back one game in the 2013 series with John Lackey was pitching. Uh, Farrell went to take him out and he said this is my game you're not taking me out and like he pitched another inning or two or whatever it was and won the game so he was that competitive I'm sure pitchers don't want to come out of the game if they're going well yeah. well uh, Rich Hill had given up one hit at the time if I'm not mistaken yeah, yeah. I think there was something going on there Jerry um, yeah it was reported that he said something to the manager watch me or something like that yeah, he yeah, he said he was getting tired. Yeah, and it looked to me like he landed in the ball. Yeah. yeah. And when he came out to the mob, I've never seen that happen before. You know, before the manager puts his hand out to, to get him the ball. Uh, you yeah. You never do that before. There must have been something else going on with him. Uh, he didn't want to pitch. It didn't look like he wanted to pitch anymore to me. Yeah, well, when, he's uh, had a lot. Rich Hill has had a lot of injury problems too along the way. A lot of blister been... problems. He had yeah. bl blister problems. So that may have been a factor that they didn't disclose it. Right. He was with the Red Sox years ago. He was awful. He, he you know, was, they brought him he up was... in 2015. He he had been on the scrap heap, and they brought him up, yeah. and he pitched well. And the Red Sox let him go, and he signed with the A's, and he had. Uh, uh, he had a fairly decent year in 2016, and then they traded him with uh, Reddick to the Dodgers for, for whatever reason. Who knows? I think that was his second stint with the A's as well. Didn't he come up originally with the A's? No, no. It was his first stint. He, he had pitched for the Red Sox before. This was He had a second stint with the Red Sox in 2015. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. He, I'm probably he's from uh, he, Cahill and Anderson. <laughs> Yeah, he's but, from uh, uh, Milton, Massachusetts, by the way. He's a local guy, too. We always got a root for the local guys, right, Skip? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Not too many of them left. All, All right. right. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about price a little bit. Uh, that was definitely a turnabout. What causes that? What causes a player uh, – <clears throat> to just dr dramatically turn around? Is it just uh, playoff intensity? Um, I, I'm just curious. To, and did he surprise you in his comeback? He didn't surprise me. I, I always thought he was a great pitcher. He, he, he had the label of, of, not being, of not being able to do well in, in the playoffs, 
but his run, his teammates did not had not given him a lot of run support in the games that he lost. And uh, Cora Cora brought him in relief to pitch an inning, and then threw him out as a starter, and he won. And then he came back with uh, I think three days rest and went uh, deep into the game uh, game in the last game. So I thought he 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 could have been a candidate for MVP of the World Series as as well as Steve Pierce. I wouldn't have been unhappy if uh, Price got the award either. I thought he did real well. Hey, let me take. Let me take time out to um, talk how baseball, when we talk baseball, it all always comes together. You know, Harvey Keene and Willie McCovey were teammates on the 62 Giants. And um, the 62 Giants, before they started winning in, in, um, in, in the 2000s, were about as good a giant team as they'd ever played in San Francisco. And they had McCovey, Cepeda, Keene, Davenport, um, of course, Willie, Haller, Ed Bailey, and Juan Marichal, of course, Gaylord Perry. That was a terrific team. But Harvey Keene, who uh, was a big, big contributor to that, that team, and, again, uh, we always talk about versatility and the importance thereof. Keene played third base on, the, on that team. He played left field. Um, he, and he was a good guy to have on the bench. So um, that's how it comes together. Um, any memories of uh, McCovey that you have, Jerry, that you might want to share? Well, I, I remember when, when McCovey broke in, he came in as a rookie midway through the 1959 season, and I think everyone was saying he went four for four against Robin Roberts. He, he ended up as rookie of the year with a 354 batting average, and you just knew that he was going to be tremendous, as uh, have a great career. And in the 62 World Series, everyone remembers he was the last out in the series, and he hit that screaming line drive that uh, Bobby Richardson caught to end the game. And uh, I just remember him as being as being one tremendous one tremendous athlete, uh, a good guy. He has 521 home runs that ties him with uh, Ted Williams. Uh, they both had 521 Hall of Fame. A uh, good guy. Never heard a bad word about him as a teammate. I, I know that there was some problems between with with the Giants with Cepeda and Marichal because they both were first basemen, and um, it was difficult for either one of them to change their positions, and so they had that that problem for a number of years. But what do you say about Willie McCovey? Uh, he's just an inspiration for everyone, and and I just thought he was a, he had a long career over 20 years in the big leagues. And uh, that's a, you know, just having and I, I just want to note that the man had 19 triples in 1959. If you combine his San Francisco Giant record, and they optioned him out to Phoenix for a while, so some of those triples were were um, in Phoenix. But um, 19 triples for a guy who hits over 500 career home runs um, it showed you before he hurt his knee he was fast, he was like Kingman he had these long loping strides but I don't think anybody speaking of Kingman could go from first to third faster than Dave Kingman will you agree with that? Uh, uh, I, I don't <laughs> I, Dave, I, I saw David run he was like a big gazelle uh, long legs and with big feet trying to get around the bases. Um, I, I'd like to make a comment about price, and I think there's there's something uh, here that, that needs to be spoken. Um, Mays and McCovey were both came from the South. Uh, this was a, a racially segregated time when these guys came up. Um, um, Mays was uh, a guy that was very uh, careful 
about his interviews. If you remember, uh, McCovey was more forthcoming. He was more interested in, in talking with people um, about about baseball. And Mays was very exclusive. Um, they had, in my opinion, they had something to prove when they came to, at least when they got to the big league. And, in, and I saw the same look on Price's face the other day. I think he was disliked, maybe scorned by, by the people in, in Boston just because of the way he pitched in Yankee Stadium that one game in the playoffs. David Price had something to prove. So you saw a man with a mission. He had a look on his face of determination that you don't see until you look at some of the superstars, and Mays and McCovey were certainly two of those guys. They had something to prove, too. They were cut above. There was something else that was driving them. It wasn't money. It wasn't fame. It wasn't. There was something else that was making them, was motivating them. And I think it was on full display this this year with, with Price's attitude, especially in that last game. Yeah. I think we've been joined finally by Michael Duca. Am I correct? Actually, I've been here for about 12 minutes. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Michael, <laughs> I'd like you to meet Skip to Lockwood. <laughs> I'd like you to meet hey, Skip Lockwood. Um, Michael. I, Michael Duca. And Jerry Feidelberg, you know, uh, we're talking about Willie Mack. We're talking about the Boston Red Sox World Series. If you would, you've been around the Giants for uh, many a year, Michael Duca, and you knew Willie very, very well. Would you be kind enough to uh, talk a little bit of number about number 44? Uh, it would be an honor. Um, he was... Uh, Let's see. I was probably the biggest Giants fan in Northern California, and uh, literally, um, I entered junior high school in September of 1962, and uh, we were seated in the homeroom in alphabetical order, so I was seated behind a young person I had never met before named Paul Cluster, and they went around the room to kind of let us introduce ourselves because obviously we had come from multiple elementary schools. And the teacher said, okay, I want you to complete the sentence. Wouldn't it be great if? And I had my answer all ready. And Paul Cluster stands up right in front of me and said, wouldn't it be great if the Giants got into the World Series and I had nothing to say? <laughs> That's how huge a Giants fan I was. And then my dad comes and announces to me in October during a rainy spell that he's just purchased a drugstore in San Diego and we're moving. We literally moved in the middle of the 1962 World Series. And so not only was I sitting in an incredibly cheap motel room watching the World Series on a small black and white TV, when that ball was captured by Bobby Richardson, I had no Giants fans around me to commiserate with. I was surrounded by Dodger fans, uh, which proved to be my fate for the next 10 years. Um, as a long-suffering season ticket holder in 1977, the Giants had a little get-together, kind of like they do Fan Fest now, but it was just for season ticket holders before the season opened. It was right after they had signed Willie McCovey back to the team. He had uh, uh, played for them in spring training but had not signed a contract yet, and they signed him to a contract then. Joe Altabelli, uh agreed that he was going to be a positive contributor to the team. And uh, I met him down on the field, and I said, welcome home. And with that typical broad smile of his, he said, well, thank you very much. And I said, by the way, you're going to win the Comeback Player of the Year award this year. And he laughed, and he said, I'll be happy if I just play well enough to not embarrass myself. Well, as we all know, he yeah. won the Comeback Player of the Year award that year. Uh, there are not a lot of people in baseball who get elected on their first ballot. 
There are not a lot of people in baseball who play more than 20 years. In fact, Ralph, you mentioned that he played about 20 years. He played 22 years, which is longer than any other first baseman in the history of the game. And he finished that career, including a couple of down years, with a 900 OPS. Um, oh. And I think one of my favorite favorite Willie McCovey stories, because everybody talks about what a warm, kind gentleman he was and how he never had a bad word for anybody. Maury Wills. When I, uh, when I was working on our book on the unwritten rules, I asked Maury about uh, what it was like being on first base with Willie because, you know, seemed to be an affable guy, and they're both African-American, and there must have been plenty of things to talk about. And he said, Willie McCovey was a magician. I said, what do you mean he was a magician? He said, Willie McCovey could take a nine-ounce baseball and catch it, and when it dropped on your ankle bone, it became an eight-pound shot. <laughs> he said he, he, was, he was a master at applying a tag that would almost break your ankle. Smiling the whole time. <laughs> so you can imagine if he, uh, when a pitcher threw over to first base and Willie will applied the tag, he sent to the runner a message, didn't he? He said it was like being hit with a hammer. Hit and, with a hammer. and he said, and, and, and the Giants, the Giants knew it, and so they would throw over five, six times before throwing a pitch. He said he just he liked to wore me out. <laughs> Like to warm me out. <laughs> uh, um, I'd like to say something story. about <clears throat> Willie died at the age of eight, I believe, which is young. Eighty, yeah. A young man to, to die. I wonder if he took care of himself. You know, would a lot of guys when they leave the game, um, they leave more than just a uniform behind. Um, I hope, I, I don't know what he died of, but I know guys in his era that didn't take very good care of themselves. You know, when they got out, they, they didn't see the doctor regularly. It was too expensive. We didn't have health insurance. It was too expensive. Um, a lot of guys let themselves go. And I, I you know, dying at 80 uh, is not a good thing these days. You should, you, the guys that, a, a guy like Billy McCovey that was in shape and, you know, virile and everything, you know, well into his 50s. Uh, I, I don't know, Skip, time. if you realize that because of his knee injuries um, and some very, very um, extensive uh, replacements that didn't work uh, and infections that set in, he was pretty immobile for I would say the last ten years of his life, I yeah. I don't think he um, he got around much without out a wheelchair all that time. Well, um, I, I I can uh, I can fill in details on that. Oh, if um, Willie had more than a, more than a dozen surgeries on each knee. He had multiple a dozen on each. Yes. Well. He had multiple knee replacements. His first ones became septic, both of them. Four years ago, he nearly died of a septic infection right. in his knees, and he was hospitalized currently for a systemic infection. Um, his body had just broken down on him. He took pretty decent care of it. He was an avid golfer until one set of knee replacements that left him unable to rotate at all. Um, he was in a, he was transported to and from every Giants game in a specialized ambulance that allowed him to be in a wheelchair that kept his legs fully extended because he simply could no longer bend them. Uh, I think the last time I recall seeing him ambulatory was about six or seven years ago. Well, that's so tragic. Huh? So sad yeah. to hear that. And there's a guy who, if you looked at his face, you'd never know it. He never, oh, no. he had the smile, an infectious smile that lit up the room, and there was no bitterness. He he could have been bitter. I mean, he, um, oh. in essence, grew up in the same 
racially disturbed time that um, that Frank Robinson did, that all these guys did, and just uh, had a way about him that uh, didn't reflect that. Willie Willie grew up the son of a Pullman operator in the deep south in Mobile, born in 1938, never played in the Negro Leagues, uh, managed to be probably, you know, almost the first black superstar who didn't, um, and was eternally and consistently grateful for the life that he got to live. I think if there was anything that you take away from knowing Willie McCovey, it was unceasing humility and gratitude. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. Yes, sir. Nice. Yeah, that's that, that's why his death is being mourned by so many people. He was absolutely probably, and I think uh, Ralph mentioned it earlier in the program, the most beloved giant uh, in the history of the San Francisco Giants. You know, Willie Mays came from New York, and it took a long time for the fans to warm up to Willie. But Willie McCovey was was a, a giant, a San Francisco giant all the way. So. Uh, I know that uh, the newspapers have been full of the and writing in Major League Baseball is the morning uh, Willie's dip passing today, uh, as I am, as we all are. Um, it's, it's really sad that he's not going to be around anymore. What better I way to end thought... it? Those are, those are great words. Um, they sure are. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, uh, all three of you, sirs. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll return uh, when we do with uh, in a much better mood. I can tell you that this is t- taking a toll on on me and uh, all of us. At, um, uh, mortality. Well, you well Ralph, before you, before you sign off, before you sign off, we would be remiss. I don't. You know, I missed the first part of the call, so maybe I missed it. But we would be remiss to point out that the Giants have lost two absolute legends from their family in the last 10 or 11 days because of the passing of Hank Green also. Oh, absolutely. Pe- passing yeah. of who? I'm sorry. Hank Greenwald, the broadcaster. Oh, yes. Exactly. We talked about him last week. Um, and, uh, yes, this is uh, this is tough, and it's not going to get easier as time goes on. Um, uh, I mentioned on an- another podcast uh, recently that there is only one surviving New York Giant from the 1951 miracle shot heard around the world, and that's Willie Mays, who's, um, I think he's 87 at this point. So um, here we go. What can I say? San Francisco Giant Baseball, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, Skip Lockwood, thank you. Jerry Feidelberg, thank you. And Michael Duke, thank you. I'm Ralph Tycho, the weak link of it all. Adios, everybody. (laughs) Thank you for listening. Rest in peace, Hank Greenwald and Willie McCovey. Adios, guys. Bye-bye now. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening.